Lab class teaching is one of the easiest ways for early career researchers to learn how to teach. Designing these classes requires a different skill set altogether. If it's your first time here, my name is Jack Wayne, a microbiologist, science educator, and the 2020 Australian University Teacher of the Year. In this installment of our Citizen Science series, we are focusing on how basic skills in genomics and bioinformatics can be adopted for your teaching through course-based undergraduate research experiences or cures. If you choose the right project, you might even be able to get the general public involved through a citizen science project. A quick disclaimer up front. Despite my best laid plans at the start of my training, I'm by no means a bioinformatician. I studied degrees for both science and information technology, but I quickly found out that I would be better suited as a bioinformatics end user rather than a bioinformatics developer. All the software engineers in my classes have been coding since they were toddlers, but for me, it felt like learning how to ride a unicycle upside down. It's pretty embarrassing actually to struggle so much in programming 101, but some people's brains are just innately better tuned for computer programming, just like others are naturally talented at music or art. It doesn't mean we should avoid the things we aren't naturally gifted at. In fact, there's a lot to be said for knowing how to learn under non-ideal conditions. Your knowledge may vary depending on the students you teach, but this video will focus on foundational bioinformatic techniques for biology students. The power of bioinformatics as a tool for learning is that genes are mysterious black boxes to most students. Sure, they understand in the abstract that DNA sequences are transcribed into mRNA, which is then translated into protein, but for them, there's no functional distinction between different sections of the DNA sequence. Bioinformatics forces students to actually go through the sequence base by base and highlight the genes different features. Can they find the start and stop codons within an open reading frame? What about the upstream promoter where the polymerase binds? How can you tell non-coding introns apart from coding exons? Which part of the translated gene product is phosphorylated by different enzymes or removed altogether via peptide cleavage sites? There are bioinformatic tools to predict each of these genetic features using databases of consensus sequences, and it's pretty much plug and play. Finding the gene or protein sequence is no longer an obstacle, it's very much Googleable as the right databases have already been indexed by Google's omnipresent crawler algorithms. But zooming out to compare your gene of interest to other genes is still within the realm of relatively niche bioinformatics tools. The science education literature focuses on the stable suite of tools provided by the big players. NCBI's basic local alignment search tool or BLAST is the closest thing to Google out of the sequence search engine algorithms in our field. There are different flavors of BLAST depending on what you enter as your search query. BLAST N uses a nucleotide DNA or RNA sequence to search nucleotide databases. BLAST P uses a protein or amino acid sequence to search protein databases. These are like for like searches, but this is where it gets more interesting. BLASTX takes a nucleotide sequence as its query input and searches protein databases. How does that work? The program translates your nucleotide query in every reading frame or six to explore if this sequence is expressed into protein in any possible configuration. PBLAST then works in a similar way, but in reverse, it accepts a protein sequence as the query and searches translated nucleotide databases on all of the possible DNA sequences that could be translated into that amino acid sequence. What comes back is an alignment between your query query sequence and a sequence flagged for similarity from the database. The algorithm tries to line up the two in the way that best showcases how similar they may be and provides metrics that help you quantify this similarity. For example, in TBLASTN, with each BLAST search result, you have identities, the number of amino acids that identically line up between the two sequences. Positives, the number of amino acids that share similar chemical properties at the same position across the two sequences and E-value, the probability that the two sequences aligned purely by random chance. If the two sequences are indeed related, you'd expect identities and positives to be high, as close to 100% as you can get, but often over 50 or over 70% identity are used as threshold cutoffs. And the E-value, a probability index between zero and one to be as close to zero as possible. In other words, very low chance that the two sequences randomly paired up as a statistical anomaly. Comparing two sequences is known as a pairwise sequence alignment. But what if you had more than two sequences to analyze? Embol EBI's Clustal Omega tool is the go-to for aligning three or more or multiple sequences. The difference or similarity between each base across all the sequences you're comparing can be used to generate a phylogenetic tree and estimate the relatedness between G sequences with robust underlying statistical models. We've just gone through a set of foundational bioinformatics tools. And while they're not considered the forefront of innovation in our discipline, 
they're more than enough to design authentic research learning activities as part of Cures. Each search within these tools can yield novel findings, and you can iterate tools, gene sequences, and search parameters to divide the workload across large classes. You can give students a list of antibiotic resistance genes, some well-known, others hypothetical or completely novel, and ask them to blast away in different genome data sets or genomes of newly discovered bacterial strains and see where these genes are found out in the wild. They rank the search results and try to assess which of the hits are real and which are false positives. You can ask students to compile all of the hits that they consider to be true matches and do a multiple sequence alignment using Clustal Omega. How much has the gene sequence changed as it's moved around from different bacteria? When do mutations in the gene appear and are they carried across different strains? Students can do some detective work to figure out if there's any evidence of horizontal gene transfer, which of course is very common in antibody resistance genes. Context is everything in this work, and that's how you can tie this into citizen science. The resistance genes can come from a new strain of a pathogen just involved in an outbreak. Because this is all software-based, there's no risk of student infections. The most powerful examples I've seen, though, combine online tools with lab-based experimentation. If you know ahead of time which strains will contain your genes of interest and they're safe enough to work with, you can have the cultured strains in the lab and ask the students to do PCR amplification to verify their BLAST results. One of the most famous examples in our field is phage hunters. Students isolate phages from environmental samples, purify them in the lab, generated DNA libraries, and sequenced them at scale for publication. It tapped into citizen science because different parts of this workflow were scalable for students with different levels of training and involved high school students as well. As you can see, these bioinformatics tools are very powerful and can quickly answer many research questions in the field. It's a perfect fit for large classes, especially when paired with specific lab-based activities to confirm the results of bioinformatic predictions in the form of cures or citizen science projects. Our previous videos in this citizen science series are linked in the description below. This is the Biolab Collective. I'm Jack Wayne and hope to see you in the next video.